Hello everybody and welcome back to the Storm Poker Challenge at MyBet.com. My name is Dylan and in the second video of the Riders of the Storm series we'd like to provide you guys with a theoretical background to the 6 max game as such which will include then uh, typical ranges per position, bet types, moves, pop manipulation as well as a few key stats for both the 6 max and full ring games. So as you see here, the title of the second video is that the swell's building, and we're going to paddle out together. For that, I'm going to provide you guys with, again, a theoretical background to 6-max play. Quite generalized, but uh, I think we'll cover most of the, the primary points to ensure that you guys are on a very good path uh, moving into moving into the actual sessions that you'll understand exactly what I'm doing, uh, you'll understand a lot of the terms. The reasons why I'm doing um, certain things, making certain making certain bets, yeah, there's a lot that goes into that. And if we were just to jump right into the session as such, the live or real time storm table cash games, then it would again be kind of like dropping you guys from a helicopter into a really really serious break and just saying good luck to you. <laughs> And we don't want to do that. You know, we want to provide you guys with a solid foundation, get you also, yeah, up to speed, so to say, on the tables themselves, right? That you have all, also all of your settings set up correctly. That, um, yeah, all the technical aspects have been taken care of, and that you also have a good understanding of six max play as such, at least theoretically. And then we'll move forward here with. Yeah, practical examples in both this and all future videos. Now, this will be the last uh, theoretical video, so from here on out, it's just going to be action. And this is maybe a bit too much um, for a lot of players out there, but I myself fully believe that it's necessary for anybody who wants to become uh, an advanced or an expert player within the shortest amount of time. So before we start, the most important thing is probably that you understand what the positions are, how people refer to them in general, and it's also important that you also understand what pre-flop bet, bet types are, and I've chosen then a hand from the Holder Manager Replayer that will also illustrate uh, exactly what variance is for those of you who still don't quite believe uh, what, I was, what I was hinting at in the first video concerning bankroll management and why that's so crucial. So this is the Holder Manager Replayer, and as we'll be using that quite a bit in the future after the real-time session recordings, I want to cover a few of the key points. As you guys see here, we're uh, winner in a week. Uh, we wake up with kings in the big blind. We're playing an NL20 game. That means the small blind is 10 cents. The big blind is 20 cents. And yeah, they have here Zoom, No Limit. Uh, that's the table. That's the date we played. And as you see here, the total pot is always illustrated in the top left corner. And then the pot odds are for the next guy to make a move. So this guy, whenever he is under the gun, he's always going to have 1.5 to 1 odds. And if he were to go all in for that big blind call, he would need 40% equity to break even in the long run. That's what that shows you up here. Keep your eye on this corner uh, concerning the pot odds. Break even equity needed uh, to make such calls as we move forward. So. Here's the button. You see this D here? That's the dealer button. All right. Small blind is, of course, right here. Big blind is right here. And then the player under the gun is in so-called early position. I'll refer to that as EP. And when you're, when you're making notes also in your post-session analysis, you're going to be writing not only what they played, but how they played it and from which position. That's why this is so crucial. It's also very important for when you're playing with uh, live stats, and you're looking at you're looking at total ranges. You don't want to confuse their total preflop raise range from early position with their total preflop raise range open from the button. It's going to be markedly different for most players. So what we have here is position that is small blind, big blind, early position under the gun, middle position. 
and that's under the gun plus one, you'll, you'll hear that referred to as UTG plus one. You'll also hear that referred to as the hijack position, so-called hijack. So that's middle position is the hijack. Then over here we have the so-called cutoff, and that's uh, abbreviated CO. All right, and that's UTG plus one plus two, right? UTG plus two. The next position is then the button itself, the dealer button, and that's abbreviated BU in most cases, and that is always, as you guys see here, UTG plus three. So then we have again, yeah, the small blind, and the big blind. So again, as a recap, small blind, big blind, under the gun or early position, middle position or the hijack, the cutoff, and again the button. That is very generally how most people refer to these positions. It's very important if you're also watching other coaching videos and again you hear the coaches yeah, refer to um, an open raise from middle position in a six max environment is they're, they're speaking about the hijack right here. So basically one after the under the gun player. And with that I think we can move forward. And again this is a um, yeah, this is also an example of why you should always adhere to bankroll management. So we pick up Kings, right? The second best hand in Texas Hold'em in the big blind. <laughs> and action continues. The first player folds. Early position folds under the gun. Middle position folds, so the hijack folds. And now it's on the cutoff here for my boy key. And <laughs> he or she uh, makes a min raise. Okay, so this is considered a min raise because it's only one times the big blind here as a raise, so two times total. So he raises it 240, and that's a min raise because it's just twice, essentially twice the big blind. This is, in poker terms, considered a two bet, even though it is a min raise. It's a two bet. And the reason for that is as follows. Theoretically, <laughs> the small blind is a 0.5 bet in Texas Hold'em. The post, when you post the blind, that's the one bet. All right, it's a forced bring-in bet, so to say. So that is very commonly ignored, but the reason that this is now a two bet, not a one bet, is because the big blind is considered the one bet, and you're forced to make that bet. So again, blinds are the forced bets. That's the one X. Here's the two bet, very good. Dealer then folds the button. Small blind folds, and we're on to act. So what's the pot right now? 20, 40, 70, and that's what you see up here on the top left. So I'm getting pot odds of 3.5 to 1, and if I'm making this call to go all in, all I need is 22% equity to break even in the long run. I'm not going all in, so if I were just to make that call, flat, say, then I would need 22% chance of hitting a playable or profitable flop in general. That's, that's how you guys can see this and, uh, and work with it here in the future. But of course, with kings, we don't just, we don't just flat, we three bet. Okay, so he makes a two bet, we make a three bet. Basically, a re-raise pre-flop. Very good. And this, this bet right here gives my opponent 2.5 to 1 odds, and he needs 29% equity if he were to go all in right now in order to break even in the long run. So what does he decide to do? Well, he just calls it, he called my three bet flat. It's also going to be referred to as calling cold or flatting. Okay, that's when you make a direct call from a, a previous raise. So now the pot is 210 and we see the flop. Five, jack, eight, two suited. And we've got our over pair of kings. Right, we're maybe a little bit worried about him, yeah, min raise flatting with 910, maybe 910 suited. Uh, min raise flats are very often also pocket pairs, so he could be on fives or eights. All these things are possible. Any kind of jack ace, jack 10, who knows? All these different things are in his range, theoretically. And of course, over pairs and everything else, right? <laughs> in this wild and wacky game. So we, for all intents and purposes, know, uh, as I'm about to show you guys, that him flopping a set is. Yeah, with the pocket pair, essentially 7.5 to 1 against, right? Uh, flopping a set or better. And we think we're still good with our kings. And we make a so-called continuation bet. So we were the last pre-flop aggressor. And then we bet 
as a continuation of our pre-flop pre aggression into this flop. It's called a C-bet in a three-bet pot. Very important, guys, that uh, you understand the difference between just a raised pot or a re-raised pot, i.e. a two-bet or a three-bet pot. Here I make my, my C-bet after I three-bet pre-flop, C-bet into that flop, and my opponent only calls. Good. What were his odds to make that call? Well, right at 2.3 to 1. He needs about 30% if he were going all in to break even. He flats. We see the next card. All right, so now it's jack, 8, 9, and the 5. The club didn't come, right? And that's, yeah, that's a good thing for us. And what I'm going to do right now is probably going to seem a bit wild to a lot of guys, but there's a reason for it. I shove. Why do I do that? Well, the reason I shove for a full, you know, almost uh, 100 and, what would that be, 121 big blinds, more or less, in the NL20 environment, I shove here because I'm not playing with my stack. I'm playing with his stack. I'm playing with the effective stack here. So the reason I shove is if I make a normal bet, let's say just another half pot bet here or a two-thirds pot bet, right, let's call it 350 or 4, that's going to be right at half of his stack already, and the pot is going to be more than his remaining stack in total. So he's committed if he makes that call on every river, more or less. And I don't want to see another club, right? I really don't want to see a queen or, uh, let's say, a seven, for example. <laughs> um, you know, if he is playing the ten queen, he's already made. But, again, I'm not going to fool around with this and and risk a suck out. So I go ahead and shove here. And, again, I wouldn't make, yeah, make this bet necessarily against a big stack player um, because I'm probably only going to get called with better hands. Now, I might make that bet with, let's say, for example, the ace jack of clubs. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that's that's for another video. I've played in preparation for this series right under 10,000 storm cash game hands. And I've seen that a lot of guys are buying in for the minimum as a mid-stack strategy. Basically, the short stack strategy wouldn't be playable here, buying in for 20 big blinds and then checking out with 25 because they've upped the minimum to a minimum buy-in per table of 30 big blinds, which in you know, 20 means 6 bucks. So you're going to be playing against effective stacks here at the Storm Tables quite a bit if you are playing the big stack strategy that we're going to be playing. So again, yeah, this, this really illustrates that you're not playing your stack necessarily, rather the effective stack in heads-up pots. So I shove here for this reason, knowing that if I make a normal bet size that he's going to be committed on every river. You know, I don't want to see another club. You know, again, not another queen, not another seven, stuff like that. may already be toast, um, but I'm putting my money to it. And I'm either, yeah, I'm either good here or not. So he then flats. And now I'm going to show his cards. And he had queens. All right, so he was, he was slow, pay, slow playing his over pair of queens. Ran into a better over pair, which is, yeah, relatively hard luck um, given my entire range. But, yeah, not really knocking this guy's play by any means. Uh, he did have position. It was, you know, it was definitely doable here with his queens. And yeah, so we, we go ahead and shove, he flats, and we get it in. This is another thing I want to show you guys here with the replayer, is our equity. Our equity here to the river is uh, expressed as 86%, and you'll always see that um, yeah, next to the player's stack size here in the replayer. So I get this in, right? I shove with 86% win chance, i.e. 86% 80, equity in this pot. That means 86% of everything that comes in right now is mine in the long run. Not necessarily in this hand, but in the long run. I'm an 86% favorite right now when I shove all in on the turn. <laughs> and what comes? Wow. The, you know, single card barring the other two queens that could help him out. So this guy, you know, he had essentially six outs and, you know, two, two queens plus the four tens. And yeah, one of those six outs came. And now this 22 bucks, which should be mine, or at least 86% of it in the long run, is now long gone, right? So a full, yeah, actually over, over a full stack, right, is now lost as a marked favorite uh, in this hand. I think perfectly played. Also, yeah, his, his play went too bad. I think his min raises, which, you know, he should raise that up in general about three times, maybe four times. And probably even four bet versus a yeah versus a three bet from the big blind in general, but yeah that's again yeah for another video. But 
in general, yeah, okay, small stakes play, and he was, you know, slow playing his queens and got lucky on the river. But this is, again, guys, why you must adhere to bankroll management. If that were my entire bankroll, right, I would have just lost it as an 86% favorite, and that would have been the end of my, uh, end of my online, online game. So, again, guys, always adhere to bankroll management. Be aware of the position, right? Be aware of the effective stack size. And with that, I think we have a, a good background to get into the, the typical ranges and, um, yeah, positional play that uh, you guys should definitely be aware of as you move forward, both in this series and also in your own play, both online and live. All right, so when we make an open raise, we're going to raise it up three to four times the big blind, as you guys see here. And if there's a limper before us, we're going to raise it up three to four times the big blind, at whatever level we're playing, plus one per limper. And if there is a raise before us, we're going to re-raise re or three bet, as I just mentioned in the example hand, approximately three times the bet before us, as a general rule. And that's what I've, what I've coined here is three time. And when you're doing that, you're really close to pot size bets, and you're essentially giving your opponents two to one odds. It's a little less, but you know the three timing principle keeps it really easy for you. If you're wondering, uh, okay, how much should I raise? What's optimal here? Well, again, just three times a bet before you, and any time that bet size will be half of either your or your opponent's stack, i.e., half of the effective stack. Then you're looking either at a push or shove in most most cases, right? We'll we'll cover that in a bit greater detail here in the coming slides. So underneath you guys see that we've got the general recommendations for no limit, six max play, and these are so-called starting hands ranges. And what I've written here is definitely adjust for the storm. The reason for that is that a lot of guys playing the storm format are gonna be playing a lot tighter ranges than you'll see underneath. But um, yeah, that's that's something that you have to you have to adjust based on the player, also based on the effective stack size. Just just so yeah, you have that also in the back of your mind. This is a general recommendation. This is not a concrete plan by any means. But what we have is early position, EP, middle position, cutoff, button, small and big blind, as we just had in the example hand in the replayer. And what's generally recommended is that you know in six max play you just raise up any pair. So anytime you see this plus, this means pair of twos are better is what that means and yeah you can also limp right this is not a fixed rule there is no fixed rule as such in poker guys as much as some other coaches would like to insist that there be def de definitive right and wrongs that there's definitely not uh, especially with starting hands so you can you can limp from time to time you can raise from time to time as long as you're changing it up and doing both I'd say you, you'll probably be right nine times in ten now, um, the one thing I wouldn't recommend necessarily is limping with aces or kings or queens, especially from early position. You you know you may get raised up, setting somebody up for a re-raise. But once you limp and then re-raise, it pretty much gives your hand away, especially if they if they put you on kind of like a novice um, novice or fish um, poker persona. Say if they give you the novice or the fish image. Then yeah, limp re-raise at the low stakes is <laughs> nine times out of ten really really big, and you don't want to just totally turn your cards over with that move, right? You can do it from time to time. I'm not saying it's wrong. Um, just saying that also when you do get called, let's say let's say you limp re-raise, and then you get two guys who flat or cold call behind you, they're only going to play on if they're good players when they can crush queens or better, and that means you'll probably be playing for stacks after the fact and only get it in good. Um, with with small pots, and when you get it in, when somebody flops a set or better, then um, yeah, you're gonna stack off. Hence the reverse implied odds of of playing your aces, kings, and queens from early position, um, weak, so to say. And again, I would just say in general, raise those up just like you raise everything else up. It'll keep you unreadable. As yeah, as a general principle, good. So from early position, we're gonna try and raise yeah, again from time to time, limp with the mid small pockets, but. You know, we're going to raise in general uh, all pairs. We're going to raise in general all Broadway that's suited. That means 10 jack to king ace. We're going to raise all ace jack offsuits. We're going to raise all ace nine suited. And we're going to raise all king queens. And if you take that entire set of hands, it comes out to 12.8% of all Texas Hold'em hands. 
Now, what I've got here <laughs> is a phrase from, from Berlin, especially it's suited as you did. And it's, yeah, it's Berlin slang, and what it means is suited is good. So, contrary to popular belief, a suited hand, as opposed to its all suited equivalent, let's say 10 jack, for example, so the same rank, 10 and jack, one is suited, one is off suited. Okay, good. In general, uh, the suited, yeah, the suited hand there is only going to have about three to four percent more equity on average. That means suited is not necessarily uted at all. <laughs> what I have written here is, yeah, meant differently. The thing that you guys should really understand is that the suitedness of the hand doesn't really increase your equity that much at all, as I just mentioned. But what it does do is give you a, give you kind of a rule to decrease your total VPIP. VPIP is voluntarily put money into the pot. It means the total number of hands you play, raise or limp, or just call in any given position. So if you adhere to the suited rule, what's going to happen is that you're only going to be suited with that 10 jack one time in four when, you, when you're dealt a 10 jack. And you'll be off suited three times in four when you're dealt a 10 jack. That means that you decrease your entire total hands played with that same rank by effectively 75% when you only play it suited. So I'm not saying play it suited because it's that much better, it's not. It's simply that you'll be playing fewer hands because you'll be pitching the off-suited um, yeah, the off-suited hands of the same rank. That's kind of the idea. So if you're looking to decrease VPIP, this suited idea is a really good idea. For example, the Ace-9 off-suit would be a pitch. Um, not because it's much, uh, the ace nine suit is much better, simply that you'll have only played it from early position, you know, one time in four rather than three times in four. That's kind of the idea. All right, so moving right along here, middle position again, all pairs for sure at that point, raising up. Again, three to four big blinds plus one per limber. And all Broadway, suited and off suited. It means from the, uh, yeah, from, oh, <laughs> yeah, good, uh, middle position. All right, all Broadway, suited and off suited, ace eight or better. Ace five suited, and that is a total range of 21.3%. Now we've got here the option to, of course, three bet. And what is a three bet? You guys remember that's a re-raise, and we can only three bet if the under the gun player, the player in EP, when we're in middle position, raises it up. And I would say in general, <laughs> again, in general, only three bet when you're just getting started. Okay, this is again very general recommendation you can change the hell out of all this but as a general recommendation if the under the gun player raises he makes a two bet I would say only three bets in general versus the EP raiser with jacks or better ace king typical general recommendation for most starting players good we're in the cutoff all right so UTG UTG plus one UTG plus two all pairs all Broadway Ace-5, all for better, any suited ace, king-9 suited or better. This 54 suited plus means all of your max stretch suited connectors. So max stretch means basically 5-4 to 10 jack. So you can flop four ways. Uh, you can flop a straight four ways. So you can flop ace-2-3, you can flop 2-3-6, you can flop 3-6-7, you can flop 6-7-8. Same with 10 jack, that's exactly how that plays. So that's called a max stretch suited connector. And we're also going to be raising the one gapper here, 10 8 suited or better. More or less, right? <laughs> and once, once we get into live play, I mean, the, the real time sessions and stuff like that, you'll see that I'll, I'll vary the, the crazy hell out of this. It's, again, it's a general recommendation. And yeah, we'll change it up from time to time, but especially the EP recommendations, I would say definitely adhere to. Uh, you can start getting creative already here and here. All right. Three bets versus the open raise from middle position of the hijack. We're looking at three betting here with tens or better ace queen. And then some speculation. So the speculation would be then small and mid pockets. Again, this max stretch suit connector kind of stuff. Good. On the button, if it's folded around to us, we make an open raise with all pairs, all Broadway hands, all aces, suited or not suited, king seven off, queen eight. Look at how wide this range is, right? It's really, really crazy. 54 suited or better and all of your one gap max stretches <laughs> suited. And that's a whole range of 41% opening from the button. That's really wide, you can tighten that up, especially given the storm. Um, 
always take into consideration the amount of times that your opponents will fold in the small and the big blind and that you will see if you're using hold and manager stats. So yeah, that's the typical or general range for the open raises from the button. And we're looking at three betting here from a previous raiser, let's say in the cutoff, that nines are better, ace jack or queen, king queen suited. And then we're also going to be re-raising or three betting then with some speculation, also a lot of bluffs. All right, because as soon as you know they get to the cutoff, they're going to be raising a lot wider, as you guys see here. So you can re-raise a lot wider, of course. And you can also flat, right? You can cold call and position on the button, outplay and post flop. There's a lot of things at your disposal when you are in position. So let's say you're in the small blind or the big blind, and what I put here is basically see the button range and then adjust it to the villain style. Uh, in online poker terms, the villain is always your opponent, and the hero is always you. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. See this range here, the button range, basically for open raises uh, from the small blind, then adjust to the villain style, your opponent style, and, the, and blind battles basically in the in the big blind. And there's a big point here. What is a steal? All right. Well, a steal is simply an open raise from the cutoff or later. So. It's folded around to the cutoff, he raises up. That doesn't matter if the, the player in the cutoff is holding aces or 2-7 and raises. Both of those bets are considered a steal. So the steal, contrary to popular belief, isn't just stealing uh, with nonsense hands. It's a positional play. So it means you can steal with aces, you can also steal with 2-7 offsuit. As long as you're open raising from the cutoff, the button, or the small blind, it's considered a steal. Also statistically soon. <laughs> What's a squeeze? Well, squeeze, as we'll get into here in a couple hands, squeeze is then when somebody open raises, let's say from middle position, the button cold calls, and you're in the small blind, and you re-raise. You make a three bet, and that is squeezing the initial raiser. And versus a steal, you make a re-steal from the blinds when you make a three bet. And squeezing at 30% or better, um, some guys will squeeze almost any two <laughs> versus um, late position raisers. This this is really really effective. Um, yeah, squeezing versus late very loose raisers and loose callers is very profitable. It's an advanced play and it's something we'll get into as we move forward. And I think you guys will probably need a couple of practical examples to really really uh, understand that. But just understand the squeeze play from from the blinds versus late raisers and loose callers is very, very effective, sometimes with any two cards. All right, so four and five betting is then, again, this re-re-re-raise and re-re-re-re-raise or whatever. Um, basically, raising a three bet is a four bet. Raising a four bet is a five bet. And I put here, in general, you know, nines are better, ace, queen are better for 5%, but it totally depends on your opponents and what they're playing. All right. This next set of ranges comes from an article in the Holder Manager uh, program itself, and it's for flatting, six max flatting, uh, six max flatting, no limit, or cold calling. So if I say flat sometimes or calling cold, I mean exactly exactly the same thing. It's just basically calling the action before you. All right, so they've defined very tight for a cold calling range at six and a half percent, basically twos to tens, queen jack suited or better. Uh, actually, 54 suited are better all the way up. So basically, max stretch suited connectors as an open flat or twos to tens, right, for set mining. Now, the reason they say this is the cold calling range is, of course, if you have jacks are better or, yeah, again, ace queen, ace king, stuff like that, they're expecting you to three bet, right? Not just to flat, but to three bet. So this would be a very tight, they define very tight here, 6.5% as a cold call range. And then you guys can just, just read through that at your own leisure here, maybe pause the video. Uh, no reason to go through that in detail. I think the ranges now are clear. Um, yeah, and I've got a little note here. Essentially, take your opponent's stats and playing style, as well as your and their table images into account whenever you're making a decision. I want you guys to not just kind of react, but actively act. All right, you wanna have a plan for the entire course of the hand, all the way to the river, and actually you want to have a plan, your general approach, to whatever level you're playing for any, any session that you begin. All right, that means online and live. <laughs> uh, last point, you know, put pressure on your opponents, put the final and most difficult question to them, and have them adjust to your game, not the other way around.
And with that, I think we'll jump into a couple of example hands uh, to show you guys what what basically a steal and a re-steal is and how that equates to yeah certain bet types pre-flop. All right, so here's another hand where we picked up a monster in the big blind. Uh, kings this time, and our total stack size is just over thirty dollars. So that means we've increased our our stack by about fifty three big blinds because you can only start with a maximum of twenty right for a hundred big blinds. So again, guys, small blind, big blind, early position, middle, cutoff, and the button, also referred to as under the gun, under the gun plus one, under the gun plus two, under the gun plus three, etc. Good, so action starts, we get a fold, we get another fold, this guy's getting pot odds for the open limp, right, or open raise of 1.5 to 1. He decides to min raise. Okay, again, min, min raises guys you typically want to avoid. Uh, everybody can flat you with anything, <laughs> more or less, if they're in position here especially. And I'll play you post flop, and a lot of fish are going to min raise this with monsters. They're going to limp with monsters. You know, if you get a limp or a min raise, re raise, you really got to watch out. So, I mean, against most novice rec players. All right, so this guy min raises up, and the button flat calls. So, this is a two bet, and this is a flat or a cold call on the button. So, he cold calls in position. What does that do? Well, it sets up these two guys when he flats for one of us to then make a three bet squeeze. And this is what I was telling you about. He basically makes an open raise, and that's for all intents and purposes considered a, a steal move, a steal raise, because it's folded to him and he's in the cutoff. So he makes a steal raise as a min raise. Okay, he two bets. This guy flats or cold calls. Small blind folds, and we make this squeeze. Now, I'm going to make this squeeze bet with a very wide range of hands. If I know that this guy is, is raising light. That means with the wide range here from the cutoff, and this guy's also calling very wide with a very wide range here on the button. So that means when I raise this up, I'm basically squeezing this guy, right, between him and myself. So this guy doesn't know if this guy's going to re-raise after the fact, that hence the term squeezing, right? So I'm squeezing him here. And he then only calls. So he min bet, or basically min raise calls my three bet squeeze. And the player here on the button also flats or cold calls. Good. The flop comes and we flop the absolute miracle. <laughs> and uh, again, holding any pocket pair, guys, you're going to flop sets essentially one time, sets are better, one time in eight and a half. So, yeah, that includes, of course, kings and aces and flopping sets or flopping sets. It's completely irrespective of the rank of the cards. So, in this case, we flop top set and it's impossible for somebody to have a better hand. So 10 jack is drawing to an open ended straight draw and it is a so-called rainbow board. Okay, so that means three cards of different suits. Very good. I've got two players here behind me. I'm out of position on all post flop streets. Okay, so we'll be talking a lot about that. Playing in position, hence on the button, right? Or out of position like we are. However, we have nothing to protect against on this flop. Right? We have the absolute nuts, and if somebody is on the 10 jack, which could have been overcalled here, um, or a set of eights, best case scenario, <laughs> then yeah, you know they may they may take the free card. Who knows? But um, we check this where we would normally in a squeeze situation typically bet c bet here on the flop, maybe 80, 90 percent of all flops. We are against two opponents though, so I want somebody to take a shot for us. So I go ahead and open check that. And the player here who min raised, then flatted my three bet, makes, yeah, two thirds pot size bet more or less. All right. This guy's getting 30%, basically 2.31, or 3.3 to 1 odds to make that call. And if he's going all in for the 390, again, I'm just going to repeat this a few times to kind of <laughs> drill it in, he would need 30% equity to the river in order to break even in the long run. All right, so he bets the 390, and I make a check raise. All right, so I make that check raise at a size that won't scare him off necessarily. If I, if I wanted to scare him off, I'd probably just shove, even though we're playing the effective stack here, right? So I'm so strong, I just check raise just enough to, to cover the remaining stack behind here. 
and he then does call us. So the check raise got it all in on the flop. Very happy with that result. Turn comes. Absolute rainbow board. And there's a river. Let's see what he had. So again, this is Dylan for MyBet.com. Wishing you all the best and definitely best of luck at your next storm table.